From the sun-kissed streets in California, the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club expands. From the counterculture movement in America and the music scene, to their rough beginnings in the criminal underworld. This is the early beginnings of Hells Angels in Australia, and how they managed to take over Australia. In 1948, after the Hollister riot, Otto Friedli moved on from his former club, the Pissed Off Bastards of Bloomington, to a new one. One that would go on as one of the most notorious of them all, the Hells Angels MC. Otto was not content with just being a member. Oh no, Otto strived for more. So he became both president of the San Bernardino Charter and national president of all Hells Angels charters across America. He held this position for some time until he was unfortunately incarcerated, which led to Sonny Barger taking over his duties as national president. Under Sonny's leadership, the Hells Angels gained notoriety. With his charisma and leadership skills, he managed to expand the club's influence far beyond what anyone could have imagined. So, when the 60s rolled around and with a changing world, it is no surprise to that the Hells Angels make their mark on the world. November 1969, and America is ripe with a counterculture revolution, and with this a new revolution. The youth of the nation is annoyed with authority. The people are challenging them at every turn and are pushing for greater social change. In this feverish atmosphere, the Hells Angels are welcomed into the counterculture with open arms. So when the Altamont Music Festival rolled around a month later on December 4, 1969, the Hells Angels were invited to provide security for the festival. It seemed like a match made in heaven. After all, who better to keep order than an outlaw biker gang? Little did anyone know that this decision would have tragic consequences. During the Rolling Stones' performance of Under My Thumb, Meredith Hunter climbed onto the stage with what appeared to be a gun in his hand. Alan Passaro, one of the Hells Angels on duty at Altamont, lunged towards him and stabbed him multiple times before he could fire any shots. The death of Meredith Hunter marked a turning point for both the counterculture movement as well as the Hells Angels themselves. When previously many saw them as hippies, fellow outcasts and rebels who wanted nothing more than freedom from societal norms, their actions at Altamont showed them to be much more controversial than their new friends had imagined. The biker gang meant business. The incident also served as a lesson for many people. Never underestimate how far someone might go when pushed too far. After this horrific incident at Altamont Festival involving both Hunter's death and Hell's Angels, the Hell's Angels' reputation is tarnished due to their involvement. Everyone will remember what happened that day. The influence that these biker gangs had over music and culture during this era cannot be overstated. Although their image may have been intimidating to many outsiders looking in, within those circles they were seen not only respected, but welcomed for being part of something larger than any individual could ever be alone. Not surprisingly, the Angels were not limited to the borders of the United States. They soon began to expand into other countries such as Canada and even Denmark. In both places, their presence sparked a deadly war with other biker clubs, but their expansion into the stereotypically laid-back country of Australia also led to a ferocious biker war. It's 1975 and the Hells Angels have just expanded to Australia, but how did it all begin? Peter John Hill, a private schoolboy from Melbourne, always wanted to visit the United States. To him, it was the epitome of cool. He dreamed about living in San Francisco's hazy summer heat and exploring all that California had to offer. When Peter arrived in San Francisco, he found himself immediately drawn in by its laid-back atmosphere and vibrant culture. But little did he know that renting such an extravagant car would draw more attention than expected, especially when the address on his rental contract happened to be the headquarters of Oakland's Hells Angels Mother Chapter. The Diamond Jubilee T-Bird has been the talk of Lake County ever since it was seen on a Hells Angels run. Speeding down the highway, the driver had no regard for speed limits or traffic laws, and when he got pulled over, he gave a dodgy address that just happened to be right next door to the mother chapter of the Notorious Motorcycle Club. This made him a person of interest in more ways than one. When it became apparent that this individual wasn't going to pay his speeding ticket anytime soon, an arrest warrant was issued. But then things took an even stranger turn. 
Nearly three weeks later, someone spotted that same car parked outside James's Jim Jim's Brandez's house in Oakland. Now, if you don't know who Jim Jim is, well, let's just say he isn't someone you want to mess with. They call him the assassin for good reason. With his connections within the Hells Angels and reputation as their hitman, people started asking questions about why exactly this nameless driver had gone from being someone of curiosity to having dealings with one of their most dangerous people in California? Let us explain. Hill joined the Melbourne chapter of the Hells Angels at the age of 24, and after his visit to the States, his life changed dramatically. So, as it turns out, this was no mere coincidence. Hill had been to the U.S. a few times before this event, and each time it was for something more sinister than the last. On this trip, he was to meet with Sergey Walton, president of an Oakland chapter of the Hells Angels. Hill knew that this wasn't going to be any ordinary meeting. He arrived at the maximum security prison where Sergey was imprisoned. This is where Hill learned how to cook methamphetamine. At first glance, it may have looked like an impossible task, but it was not long before Hill became a smuggler for the Hells Angels. After months of hard work planning out routes and finding buyers across both countries, Hill eventually managed to get his hands on enough P2P for multiple batches of meth production, earning himself quite the reputation along with some serious cash too. When Hill came back to Australia, he knew exactly what had to be done. Turn this local gang into an organized crime ring that would have far-reaching effects on both sides of the Pacific Ocean. He set out with determination, recruiting new members and setting up deals with powerful drug lords in South America and Asia. Within months, Hill's criminal enterprise had spread throughout Australia like wildfire. He recruited members like Roger Biddlestone, Raymond Hammond, and John Paul Madded. Armed with Sergei's new knowledge, Peter and Raymond rent out a farmhouse near Hurstbridge, where they set up shop for making amphetamines in 50-pound batches worth $600,000 each on the street. Talk about lucrative business. They even shipped over 200 liters of phenylacetic acid over to their American counterparts by hiding them in Golden Circle pineapple cans. Enough material for almost $55 million worth of amphetamines. Unfortunately for them, though, police raided their drug lab in 1982, leading to around 40 violent incidents between rival gangs as everyone tried settling scores after this blunder after this raid. Despite all this commotion, though, it certainly did not stop Peter Hill and Raymond Hammond from establishing themselves as some very influential figures within Melbourne's underworld during that period. But it wasn't long before Hill showed his true colors. Hill was only in it for himself. Hill turned on the gang and cooperated with police, setting off alarm bells within the organization. It didn't take long, though, for the Hells Angels to find out. The MC are determined to teach these two a lesson for their ultimate betrayal, and so a hit was put on Hill and Biddlestone. Nine members were charged with conspiring to murder Hill and Biddlestone, but unfortunately none could be convicted due to lack of evidence, largely because Biddlestone refused to testify against his former clubmates. But that was not all. Several bikies were eventually convicted on drug charges after three trials, the first one being scrapped when an unlucky juror accepted a $10,000 bribe. To make matters worse, they also needed help paying legal costs, so Oakland Angels sent over $50,000. This incident led the police to track the movements of the notorious gang, especially after an American Hells Angels James patron tried to assassinate a police officer on the case. They codenamed this operation Omega-2. Patron tried to escape by fleeing to Melbourne, but Patron was caught at customs and was sent packing back to the States instead. To this day, Hell's Angels MC remains one of the largest motorcycle clubs in existence, with chapters all around the world, including Europe, Canada, Asia, and Australia, providing members with a place to belong while also allowing them to show their pride in who they are and what they stand for. All these years later, after being founded 70 years ago by Otto Friedli under Sonny Barger's leadership, it has become an iconic part of biker culture worldwide. I hope I was able to shed some light on the Hells Angels in Australia. Feel free to write your video requests in the comments. With that, I thank you for tuning in.